Hello everyone and welcome tonight to the Athena Swan Lecturer to celebrate International Women's Day 2021. I'm Joss Ivory, I'm Chief Operating Officer at the University of York. Just before we get going with tonight's lecture, I just want to mention a few technical notes. So if you're watching live, can I um, mention that you can ask questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This is available throughout the event for you and can, questions can be asked at any time. Should you have any technical issues, such as loss of Wi-Fi, you will be able to rejoin the event using the original link, and please do so if you do um, lose contact. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again. Subtitles are available at the in, for the event. If you wish to turn them off uh, or on, use the CC Live trans Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So that's the technicalities out of the way. Let me introduce tonight's speaker, Sarah Lashava. I'm just going to tell a little bit about this before I hand over to Sarah. When Linda Babcock wanted to know why male graduate students were teaching their own courses while female students were always assigned as assistants, her dean said, more men ask, women just don't ask. Drawing on psychology, sociology, economics and organisational behaviour, as well as dozens of interviews with men and women in different fields and at different stages of their career, Sarah Lashaba will discuss the groundbreaking classic co-authored with Linda Bab Babcock, that explores how women can and should negotiate for parity in their workplaces, homes and beyond. A leading authority on the challenges that shape women's lives and careers, Sarah is the co-author with Linda Babcock of the groundbreaking book, Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide and Positive Strategies for Change and Ask for It, and how women can use the power of negotiation to get what they really want. She's written extensively about women in business, women in literature and the arts, women in academia and women in the sciences. Sarah worked as a research associate and principal interviewer for Project Access, a landmark, landmark Harvard University study that explored impediments to women's careers in science. She's a founding faculty member of the Carnegie Mellon Leadership and Negotiation Academy for Women. And she also served as a senior fellow at the Center for Work-Life Policy, now the Center for Talent Innovation, and as academic coordinator for the inaugural WIN Summit, a national conference focused on helping women learn to negotiate. This evening's event will take the form of a presentation followed by questions from the audience. So as I mentioned earlier, you can submit the questions throughout the event using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and I'll put as many as possible to Sarah at the end of her talk. I've read Sarah's book, Women Don't Ask. It is absolutely fascinating. It's definitely a good read. I won't give you any spoilers here, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah. Oh, hi everybody, uh, welcome. Good to see you all today. I'm just gonna share my screen and get started. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, so um, we have a lot to do and I wanna dive in, but first I just wanna say, I'll be talking a lot about differences between men and women, but I wanna note that non-binary individuals face similar challenges to those faced by women and those challenges can be compounded for people who are also members of other minority or marginalized groups, such as women who are also people of color or non-binary folks who are also immigrants or disabled, for example. This talk should be helpful for all those demographics. So let's get started. You may be thinking, I'm here because I know I need to negotiate, I'm supposed to negotiate. Do I really have to? It makes me anxious. I'm no good at it. And I'm afraid it'll backfire because I know that people don't like it when women seem too aggressive and negotiation feels like an aggressive thing to do. This is typical. In one study, 20% of women said that they never negotiate. If they have kids, that's probably not entirely true. But the statistic points to an important fact. A lot of women hate negotiating but you sacrifice a lot if you avoid it. And let's start with the money. One study showed that women who consistently negotiate their salary increases can earn at least a million dollars more during their careers than people who don't. And this study was done in the US obviously, uh, and we're not talking about low skilled workers or workers in lower paying jobs, but still that probably seems kind of crazy high. So let's look at how uh, that was calculated. Let's imagine we have two people, a man and a woman, and they start out their careers making about the same amount of money. He's in red, and as you can see, he starts out making a bit more because men typically are offered more starting out. 
And from then on, he routinely negotiates his raises and ends up averaging 4.3% annual increases over the course of his career. Every year she takes whatever she's offered, never asks for more, and averages only 2.7% increases. With each raise calculated as a percentage of what they made the previous year, the gap between their salaries widens rapidly and dramatically. So by the time they're ready to retire, he's earning over 100,000 pounds more than she is. That's a nice extra amount in his paycheck that year, but you need to remember that he earned more every year that they both worked. And with that difference rapidly compounding, he will have banked over two million pounds more by the time they retire. And I can think of a lot of nice things a girl could do with all that money, maybe buy a nice vacation home, see the world if she likes to travel, buy some expensive luxury goods, or donate generously to the charity of your choice. Of course, earning more money isn't just about vacation homes and fancy cars. It's primarily, probably, about what you can do for your family. Um, and as I said, women don't like to negotiate. And I know this is true because I wrote my books, as you can see, with a behavioral economist at Carnegie Mellon University here in the States named Linda Babcock. And in researching this question, Linda did a lot of different studies, many different methodologies, and her results were enormously consistent. And what she found is that men ask for things that will help advance their careers on average four times as frequently as women do. At every stage, men are more likely than women to knock on the boss's door and ask for something that will help them get ahead. So that means if you're a woman and every quarter, every three months or so, you get up your nerve and go in and ask for something that will be good for your career, the typical man is doing that 16 times a year. And he's not getting everything he's asking for, of course, but simply because he's asking for so many more big and little things, he's gonna be pulling ahead of you steadily and rapidly. And I wanna stress that negotiation is not just about money. I start with the money because it's so dramatic and easy to quantify, but it's clear both from Linda's research and from the many interviews I conducted for our books that it's not just money that men ask for and women don't. In so many different realms, men are more likely than women to raise their hands and say, pick me, pick me. They're more likely to ask to be assigned to high prestige projects or high value accounts more likely to ask for referrals in fields where referrals are necessary to build your practice, more likely to ask for a chance to work with a more senior person from whom they can learn or to work in a different area that interests them, much more likely to ask to be released from time-consuming responsibilities that should be handled by more junior people, more likely to ask for whatever else they need to be more productive and get ahead. Women are more likely to think, I'll just do a great job. I'll cross every T and dot every I. I'll do excellent work and I will be rewarded appropriately because we live in a meritocracy, right? Well, sadly, no, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. You really do need to hustle more than that. And because men are socialized to hustle more and they're more comfortable doing so, we often see men who are equally qualified, sometimes less qualified than we are, advancing up the ladders of our professions and earning more money much more rapidly. And there's another important piece of this that I wanna discuss, and that's leadership. Being an effective negotiator won't just help you climb up that professional ladder. It's also essential if you're going to be an effective leader once you reach the upper rungs. We know that command and control doesn't work for women and that people respond badly to women they think are bossy or pushy or overbearing. So to be an effective leader, women need to use the tools of negotiation. You need to ask a lot of questions, listen closely, figure out what people really want that they may not be saying. With people you supervise, you need to make clear that you can help them get where they wanna go if they work hard, follow your lead, buy into your initiatives and help make your programs a success. 
with your professional peers and other senior people, you need to let them know that you'll support their pet projects in exchange for them backing up yours. For women, I'd argue leadership is all about negotiating. So to recap, here's a partial list of things you sacrifice if you don't learn to be an effective negotiator. And there's another part of it, which involves making sure you're being treated fairly, taking ownership of that, being the person who's in charge, who controls your own career. And fairness is not just a nice thing for individuals, it's actually essential to a healthy work culture. Um, briefly now, I would like to talk about causes. Why don't women negotiate on their own behalf more? We've identified three basic major causes, and the first has to do with the socialization of children, what we teach kids about how we want them to behave as males and females in our culture. So how do we want them to behave? Um, we want girls to be sweet-tempered, good-natured, cheerful, and compliant. We don't like pushy, grabby, bossy, demanding little girls. We teach boys different lessons to be little tough guys, to get in there and fight for what they want and stick up for what they deserve. We also teach girls to be communal, to focus on the needs of other people, while we encourage boys to promote their own interests, to get what they want for themselves and get ahead. And children learn these lessons really early and really well so much so that as early as first grade, so we're talking about six-year-olds, boys will raise their hands in class, even when they don't know the answer to a question, thereby asking for, in this case, the teacher's attention. And little girls will not raise their hands even when they do know the answer. They have already learned by the time they are six to wait to be recognized for their brains and their hard work and their accomplishments. I always like to point to that smiling little girl in the back of this picture because I think she knows the answer, but she doesn't have her hand up. The second factor involves the types of behavior we accept and tolerate in women as adults. We don't like aggressive women. Studies are clear that it's not just men who react badly to women they perceive as too aggressive. It's other women too. And we punish those supposedly too aggressive women. We devalue their work based on their personal style or their manner, rather than on the objective quality of what they produce or what they do. We don't include them in our social and professional networks. We don't invite them to collaborate with us. We don't assign them to plumb projects. We give them weak endorsements when they ask us for recommendations. And of course, we stigmatize them with ugly names. We call them difficult, high maintenance, not a team player, and of course, this one, which I never need to say out loud. And other women who are a little less confident, a little unsure, is it okay to ask for what I want? How do I do that? They see women who are a little bit more forthright, a little bit more direct about their goals and what they want, being rebuffed in this way, essentially sanctioned socially. And they think, well, that's a bad strategy, obviously. I need to just sit tight and be grateful for whatever I'm offered and not rock the boat and not cause problems. And I'm here to persuade you that those are not the only two options. The third factor has to do with networks. Women are typically peripheral to or excluded completely from the social and professional networks in which men share a lot of information and give each other a lot of advice. So let's start with information people in charge often know a lot about resources and opportunities that are coming down the pike. Frequently things that they can distribute at their own discretion. And they don't always knock on the door of everyone who might be qualified. They don't post an announcement on a physical bulletin board or a virtual bulletin board, letting know anybody who's qualified, you know, what's going on, just make sure that they know. They mention it to the people in their networks. Since so many of the people in charge continue to be men, and most of the people in their networks are also men, one reason that men ask for things more than women do is that they simply have more information about what's available, what they could or should be asking for. And then there's the issue of advice. Men don't merely tell each other what to ask for, they tell each other who to ask, how to ask, when to ask. 
women have less of both, less information and less guidance about what to ask for and how to negotiate successfully for what they need. So the net result of all these factors has been to create very different feelings about negotiating in men and women. And a wonderful researcher named Michelle Gelfand did a study that captured this perfectly. And what she did was she asked people to identify words and metaphors that expressed how they felt about negotiating for themselves. And men chose words like fun and metaphors like winning a ball game. That's baseball. I think the UK corollary would probably be a cricket match. Uh, women chose words like scary and metaphors like going to the dentist. So if you feel as though negotiating is a lot like getting your teeth drilled, you might just rationalize avoiding it. Here are a lot of the rationalizations that I've heard. I hope I've persuaded you not to rationalize your way out of negotiating for what you want, need, and deserve. And now let's get to work and begin learning how to negotiate in ways that feel authentic to you, that we know work best for women, and that will give you the best chances of success. Start by assuming that everything is negotiable. Everything is not negotiable, but so many more things are than we tend to think. It's a good place to start. And here's a list of all sorts of things that might be negotiable in a given work situation. I don't know enough about the particulars of your situation to be more precise about this list, but I wanted to get you thinking about what you could potentially ask for. And next, decide what you want. This may seem obvious, you want a promotion, you want a raise, but I actually want you to think more deeply and more holistically and more long-term, not about what you're supposed to want, not what other people want, not what will be easy to get, what's straight ahead of you, and not necessarily what you wanted at the beginning of your career or when you started at your current job. What would make you happier? What skills do you have that aren't being used? What do you enjoy doing that you never get to do anymore in your job? What would be most rewarding in the near term, three to five years out and say 10 years or more from now? What would you like to have achieved by the end of your career? I taught a program at Credit Suisse in New York some years ago and during the Q&A, <coughs> excuse me, one woman said she was worried that people would get asking fatigue if she kept asking, asking, asking for things all the time. And that is not what I'm recommending. I want you to focus on your goals so you can ask strategically for the things that will get you where you want to go. So do you want more training? Do you want to go back to school? Do you want to make a lot of money? Do you want to eventually be the big boss? Do you want to get into the room where it happens, where big decisions about strategy or compensation are made? Do you want to work with a more congenial or really dynamic team? Would you like an overseas posting? Would you like to start your own business? Do you want to win a prestigious prize in your field? Think deeply about what it is that you really want and then identify some concrete things you could ask for now that will help you achieve those goals. And I'm talking about very specific things, not I'd like more leadership opportunities, but I'd like to put together a team to pioneer a specific initiative or something like that. Not, I'd like to help the institution get more involved with the community, but I'd like to reach out to the leaders of this local organization and explore partnering with them to do X, something concrete. I recommend reviewing your goals on a regular basis to track how they may have evolved and then devoting some time to thinking about what to ask for right now that will move you in the direction you wanna go. Next, do your research. This may be the most important piece of advice you're gonna hear from me today. There's an old saying that people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. With negotiating, that's especially true. How well you do in a negotiation will largely be determined by how well you prepare. And your research should focus on two things. First, comparables. What are other people at your level asking for, getting, and getting to do, both inside your organization and at your organization's competitors and in allied industries where your skills are in demand? Second, 
what's the context in which you'll be making your request, both inside your, uh, inside your organization and out in the marketplace. So I'm talking budget, strategic plans, external competition, political infighting, anything that might have an impact on your negotiation, on your ability to get what you want. The more you know about the context, the better equipped you'll be to craft a winning plan. And when it comes to comparables, be sure to compare apples to apples, which means comparing yourself to men as well as women. Since women are often scarce in senior roles, women who rise up to those levels often compare themselves to female peers who are more junior and whose situations are not actually comparable. So apples to apples. And how to do this? Well, you know, obviously your research campaign should start on the web. There are many excellent sites that aggregate information about all professions and contain a ton of data. Here are a few good ones. I also wanna draw your attention, not just to the websites, but the Office for National Statistics, which has a lot of data about different, uh, different professions, different roles, broken down by gender, ethnicity, that kind of thing, very useful. Uh, there are also many more, and there are lots of sites devoted to particular fields. And many of those sites also track region specific data, such as where there might be a shortage of people with your skills or differences in the cost of living in case you're considering re relocating, pardon me. Most professional associations these days also have information on their sites about challenges women face in the field and share advice from the experts about what's essential for women to get ahead in that field. And in addition to do a lot, sorry, in addition to doing a lot of resourceful Googling, you also need to do what I call ground level intel gathering, that is talking to people. So your colleagues, people in your professional network, see what they know. People are usually pretty happy to share their wisdom and their expertise. They may feel flattered and not only will you learn what they know, but they may remember you the next time they hear about an opportunity for which you would be suited and they might bring up your name or send you an email alerting you to that. Uh, you know, ask everybody, ask, uh, you know, your mentors, uh, ask men as well, well as women, because if you can only talk to women, you'll be talking to people who think you can only get about 85% of what's actually possible, which as I said, is the approximate wage gap in the UK. There's another piece of it about talking to men as well as women. And that's that studies show that women will only apply for a new position if they have close to 95% of the qualifications listed on the job posting, while men will apply if they have 60% of the qualifications required. Men apply based on what they consider to be their potential, in other words, while women apply based on what they have already proven conclusively that they're capable of doing well. So if you ask a woman about applying for a stretch role without any failure of sisterhood or wish to hold you back, but thinking about you the same way she thinks about herself, she might say, so tell me what's on your CV again. Well, if you ask a man, also thinking about you the same way he thinks about himself, he might say, you should totally go for that. You'd be great at that. So talk to men as well as women. See if you can check in with any power brokers within your organization, if they're approachable. Maybe reach out to an old professor who's well-connected in your field or university classmates who have landed at your employer's competitors or who work at places where you'd like to work. And I'm a big fan of befriending the administrative assistants who work for people in power. They often know a lot about what other people have asked for and gotten or not gotten, what's going on with your boss that might make this a really good or not so good time to ask, and give you other tips about how to increase your chances of success. Make friends with these people. And don't overlook the people who are always up on the latest gossip. They can be great sources of information about what's really going on in the organization. So now that you've done all your research, it's time to make final decisions about what exactly to ask for in this negotiation, recognizing that most negotiations are about more than one thing. 
not just about a salary increase, but a title change, more responsibility, a larger office, a different schedule, a bigger budget, maybe equipment upgrades, more vacation time. Lots and lots of things can be on the table. My biggest piece of advice is to aim high. There's a direct correlation between your target or your goal going into a negotiation and what you end up getting. If you aim low, you'll get less. So use your research. Don't ask for things that are totally unrealistic, but then aim for the top of the range for whatever it is that you plan to ask for. Next, focus on what you bring to the table. For most people, but particularly for women, to be successful in a negotiation, you need to make what we call a relational argument. Rather than going in and saying, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what I deserve, you need to show how giving you what you want will be good for the other side. And we call this your value proposition, and it will be different for each ask, each negotiation. You don't wanna go in every time and just recite what's on your CV. They can presumably read your CV. You need to describe the specific experiences, achievement, skills, talents, interests, that position you to succeed? Do you have a stellar track record in your current role that shows you're capable of doing so much more if you get that promotion with its extra responsibility and authority? Do you have a lot of useful contacts that will help you get your proposed initiative off the ground? Do you have a special passion for the issue? Links to the target demographic or to a geographic region? What kind of story can you tell about the positive impact you can have on the organization if you get what you're asking for? Next, if this is a high stakes negotiation and you have time, try to improve your negotiating skills. Negotiating well is not rocket science, it's a skill set. And like anything else, the more you practice, the better you'll get and critically, the more confident you'll feel. Linda and I wrote our second book, Ask For It, specifically as a self-training manual for women because we heard a lot after Women Don't Ask was first published, women would say, yeah, I have this problem. Tell me what to do about it. So we wrote this book and we include a six week training program we call the Negotiation Gym that a lot of women work through together. Actually, that can be a fun way to do it. Uh, you know, Get your negotiating muscles in shape. There are lots of other great negotiating books out there with the more general focus. And if working through a book doesn't suit your learning style, consider taking an executive education or continuing education course. It's a great investment in your future. I found a few programs online uh, that might be worth checking out in the UK. I can't vouch for them personally. Do a little legwork and find the best one for you. If you can do this well in advance of a, one of those critical high stakes negotiations, all the better. Your last step should be to prepare psychologically. So many people, especially women, feel a lot of anxiety about negotiating. And that anxiety can undermine your ability to perform well when you're actually in the room in the middle of that conversation. I recommend getting together with someone you trust, briefing them thoroughly about the negotiation, especially what you're worried about, and then play it through several times. Ask them to really push your buttons, hurt your feelings, insult you, embarrass you, say things you fear might make you lose your composure, and then practice calm, reasoned responses that move things away from those flashpoints toward a more problem-solving mode, which we know produces better agreements for both sides. And this has two benefits. One, if the thing you're worried about actually happens in the negotiation, you'll be prepared with a considered response. Second, if your emotions are triggered during the negotiation, those feelings won't take you by surprise because they will have already been triggered in your role play. And it turns out that it's the surprise as much or more than the actual feeling that tends to derail us. We think, oh no, I'm upset. I've lost control of my feelings. So we accept whatever's on the table so we can get out of the room. If instead those feelings have already been triggered in the role play, it's much easier to say to yourself, yep, that makes me angry and continue with your plan. So I am a big fan of role play. 
And then lastly, try to get yourself in a good mood before you go into your negotiation. Research is clear that negative emotions are contagious. They're catching. So if you have a fight with your kid or your partner right before showing up for your negotiation, or you get stuck in bad traffic and you're almost late, or you fly in for an interview and the airline loses your luggage, you are going to go into that room frustrated and irritable and the other negotiator is likely to catch those negative feelings and that will send the two of you into a negative conflict spiral that ultimately probably damage the quality of the agreement you reach. Similarly though, positive emotions are also contagious. So if you can go into your negotiation feeling upbeat and cheerful, this will influence the other negotiator's mood too and you're likely to have a more productive conversation. So if endorphins are your friend, try to schedule your negotiation so you can go for a run beforehand or maybe a swim, or perhaps you could take a break for a yoga class or to meditate. Some women have told me that putting on headphones and pouring a complex piece of classical music or a joyful piece of pop music into their heads right beforehand can send them into their negotiation feeling centered and cheerful. Another option is to have lunch with the people who make you feel like the most hilarious, delightful person in the world, but don't have a drink. And now that you're ready, it's time to put it all together. And the most crucial thing starting out is to set the right tone. Do not go in there guns blazing. Research has shown that in order to be persuasive, in order to be influential, women need to come off as likable. We need to abide by that normative expectation that women will be friendly and sociable and kind. So how you ask as a woman your manner is extremely important. Try shaking hands when you walk in, inquire about the other person's work challenges, maybe engage in a little friendly small talk, and make warm eye contact, use relaxed open body language, and try to adopt an even toned, calm way of speaking. This can seem maybe anti-feminist, like a big step backwards, but I totally respect women who don't wanna do it. It means walking a pretty narrow tightrope. You don't wanna come off as threatening, but you also don't wanna be flirtatious. You don't want to seem too stern, but you don't want to come off as kittenish or excessively passive. It's a pretty narrow tightrope and it absolutely places an extra burden on women. If in addition to everything else we're tracking, we also need to make sure that the other people in the room are basically having a good time. But I recommend it to you for your consideration as a strategy rather than a sellout since it will make it possible probably for you to go a few more rounds, increase your chances of getting more of what you want, and also make the whole interaction more pleasant and less likely to get combative. Next, make a strong, well-supported argument. Any data you can provide, any paperwork, any numbers, whatever, any information you can share to support your argument increases the odds that you'll get what you want. And then ask a lot of questions. Asking questions is the negotiation super skill. Try to find out what constraints might prevent the other negotiator from being able to give you what you want. Try to find out what their goals are for the negotiation, and basically what they're hoping for. Maybe you'll discover that they have a problem you can solve and they'll be so grateful that in exchange, they'll be happy to give you what you're asking for or perhaps their reluctance to give you what you want is driven by a misunderstanding that you can clear up, or maybe they can't give you what you want right now, but they could in six months or a year, but you could get the commitment from them now. Not only will you glean a lot of useful information by expressing interest in their problems and their goals, you'll, all, you'll also be communicating that you care about them. And that can prevent the com conversation from becoming combative. That is you know, a side benefit to the information gathering piece of it. And lastly, don't let yourself be rushed. Research shows that people who hurry through a negotiation tend to leave value on the table. They don't get everything they could, could have gotten and they come away with inferior agreements. 
And it's tempting to rush. Negotiations are stressful and the urge to get them over with is strong. And if you think there's a chance the offer will be rescinded, if you don't say yes immediately and you still want the job, then by all means accept it. But that actually doesn't happen very often. We hear about things like that in the press precisely because they're so rare. That just isn't common. If an organization has done a big search and decided you're their first choice, then you're their first choice and they're gonna try to, try to make it work for you. So try to go slowly. And if you feel things careening out of control or it's going too fast for you, learn something significant that changes the picture, it's usually fine to ask to take a break. Say, can we pick this up again in half an hour or two hours tomorrow, next week, then go back to your desk, collect yourself, review what's happened so far, maybe make a few calls or get back on the web if you learn something new and then decide how you want to proceed. Hopefully you'll reach a good agreement. And once you do, confirm the agreement in writing. If it's a handshake agreement, people often have different ideas about what was agreed to. When I teach negotiation workshops, classes, after role-playing negotiation exercises, I'll often ask students to go home and write up the agreement. And you'd be surprised how often the two sides versions don't agree. If that happens after one of your negotiations, go back and forth until you both can sign off on it and confirm the final agreement in writing too. There we go. Um, so here's a bulleted summary of everything I've suggested today. Um, and I know this will be posted online if you, uh, if you want to review. And here is how to contact me. And if you want to email me with questions that you don't get an answer to, Today, just put in the subject line where you met me, basically, that it's, it's from New York. And that's all I've got today. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Fascinating. Um, I've been sort of trying to make notes with questions as they've been coming through. You won't have seen how many questions are coming through. Um, and in fact, I'm probably going to struggle with new ones as they're coming through because there's been... Um, <laughs> been some bit of stream of them at the end. I'm going to start off, uh, Sarah, let me ask you, um, and thank you to the audience for engaging as well, some really, really useful questions, and we won't get through them all. Uh, so I will try and prioritise and group them. Uh, but what I would like to do, what we will do, Sarah, is perhaps feed these to you anyway, so you can get a sense yeah. from the audience of the kind of things that are are um, of interest to them and, mm -hmm. uh, and the engagement that there has been. Can I just start, there's been a few questions about um, you know, you gave the example of the girl at the back smiling, you think she knows the answer. And so there's a few questions about the way we bring up our children. And, you know, if you're a mother of daughters, how can you encourage their skills early on uh, to, to address this? So can you talk a little bit about that, about any tips, techniques, any of the research evidence around that? Sure. So um, there's a lot. And if you're really interested, Women Don't Ask has a great deal of research uh, that we cite about this. A couple of things are, you know, give your kids uh, toys that, um, you know, involve, uh, that are typically gender neutral or, you know, give girls boys toys, let me, let me put it that way. So girls toys typically are involved with caretaking. They're baby dolls, they're tea sets, they're kitchen sets. So they teach girls to pay attention to the needs of other people to take care of other people. Boys toys, are more about self-determination. How do I make this toy, this train set work the way I want it to, or this whatever construction project go, you know, I need this piece, I need that piece, I need to have an impact on this imaginary landscape outside the home. Um, and their boys' toys are more about setting a goal. This is what I want to make happen, and this is what I need to, to get it to do what I want it to do. So give girls some toys like that as well. Um, I'm a big fan of annotating the uh, media that comes in, the books they read, the stories um, that they you know, hear on television or watch on television. There's a famous book uh, uh, out of Boston, which I live just outside Boston called Make Way for Ducklings. And the story is Mr. and Mrs. Mallard, uh, you know, are looking for a place to have their uh, their family, they, you know, Mrs. Mallard lays some eggs and sits on them and Mr. Mallard goes off on vacation. He goes off exploring. She teaches the ducks how to 
you know, whatever, swim and dive for food. And then they meet Mr. Mallard in Boston Common in this pond at the end. And he's like, oh, great. The kids are all raised and know what to do. So when I read that to my kids, I was like, dad would never do that. <laughs> That's weird that he left right when the babies were being born. So comment on the, uh, the media they're consuming. And then a big piece of it is, has to do with chores. Boys are much more frequently paid for their chores than girls are. So dad will say, you know, shovel the snow, rake the leaves, wash the car, and I'll give you five bucks or five pounds. Well, mom will say, you know, take care of your younger sibling, help me clean up uh, the dishes, help me in the kitchen, and no pay. So boys learn that they work for money, that if they put in the time and the effort and they do a reasonably good job, they get paid. Girls learn that they work for love, which doesn't pay very well nowadays. So uh, those two pieces, uh, annotating media and, um, you know, thinking about their chores, actually three pieces I talked about toys too. There's a lot. And as you can see, I'm, you know, my head's full of it all because I think it's so interesting. But I encourage you to read more about it. Absolutely. I mean, it is, it's uh, the, the fact that it's so, um, starts so early on. It's, yeah. They gave the example of two, a man and a woman starting pay at the same level. Yeah. Uh, and, and it starts there. It starts actually, as you say, way beyond that. Um, yeah. Just for a minute, one of the questions we have was around what do you think organisations can do to encourage women to progress? Because you talked a lot about sort of what women can do. What right. do you think organisations could do? And I'll add my own thing into there about what would, uh, you know, one or two things that you think would make the biggest difference. Well, the most obvious thing is for them to track and publish data about both about salaries and about levels of, of progress, you know, where women are, you know, getting to in the organization. Transparent data sharing is enormously powerful because an awful lot of people, a lot of men in positions of power, they don't, they're not consciously trying to discriminate against women. They're not purposefully trying to be unfair, they really are unaware of their implicit biases. And when they see the data, when they see how really pronounced the differences are, that makes them reflect on their decision-making uh, as they go forward. So that's very, very useful. And of course they can then make a commitment to trying to get everybody at the same level, you know, up to parity. So, all right, we're gonna correct now, now that we've collected the data, and we see, you know, that things are are distorted. We're going to make some make some changes. Uh, there's also uh, there, are, you know, a lot of good evidence about the power of sponsors. So that's not just a mentor who gives you advice, but somebody who actually decides they're going to take you on as their protege and go to bat for you, recommend you, you know, all, get you into position where you can be more successful. And if organizations set up a sponsorship program where they match people, uh, younger people, more junior people with um, more senior people who can help them along, that's very useful. That's great. I mean, one of the questions was around um, about male, men, men as allies. How can we start to change the perceptions of men, the views of men in the workforce who often seem offended when women ask for things and how do we enlist more male allies? I mean, I think you've partly answered that about you know using data, transparent data sharing. Um, I mean, if there's anything else to add on to that, have you seen any experience of uh, where well, an ally program has worked? My um, experience is that it actually is getting a little better because the millennial generation is just different from the boomers who were in charge. And the millennial generation is huge and it's moving up you know, into more senior positions. And men in that generation are much more likely to want a lot of the things that women have always wanted, which is more time for their families, better, you know, work-life balance, time for their hobbies and their causes. Um, plus an awful lot of them have mothers who work, sisters, um, you know, wives, partners, uh, friends who are female. So if there is somebody from that cohort that you think is approachable, say go make friends with that person. Uh, I said that women are typically excluded from men's networks. Make friends with those men whom you know, you know, his wife is a high powered professional. He's going to understand this. Or even a more senior guy who has a daughter. I always say that there's nothing like having a daughter to turn a man into a feminist. Um, approach those guys, ask them essentially to escort you into those 
networks to make space for you and introduce you. That can be uh, that can be great. And there are a lot of a lot of good guys out there. Uh, my work is not in any way demonizing men. I think we're all the products of a lot of socialization, a lot of conditioning that we're not uh, completely aware of. That's great. Um, I mean, I think there's there's something about, you know, how do we get younger women engaged in this advice? And I think you've addressed that there and about a, a recent question at the bottom here about increasing self-esteem in girls. I mean, do you think there's enough in education programs within schools as part of the core curriculum? Well, here's the thing about school. Um, girls actually do a lot better in school than boys do, um, a great deal better. So in the last 20, 30 years, girls have been graduating at the tops of their classes at much higher rates, going on to higher ed at higher rates, getting advanced degrees at higher rates. And this is actually an uh, ironic way kind of a disadvantage for women because girls grow up thinking that they know how to be successful. They know how to excel. They will cross every T and dot every I. They'll do great work. They'll be serious. They'll focus and they'll get an A. And then they get out into the workforce and they find that the culture of work has not changed in the ways the culture of school has changed and they're not prepared for it. So I'm a big fan of really not just teaching girls how to negotiate, bringing this to, but actually getting some of the girl serving organizations involved. So Linda Babcock, my co-author, developed a negotiation training badge for the Girl Scouts in this country. So girls who are 11 or 12, find it, this is a skill and they can practice it and do it better and learn that that's something girls need to do. So any ways in which you can draw attention to this and actually you know, girls are good at learning stuff. Teach girls to do it early. The earlier you get this message out to, to girls and women, the better. And I meet women all the time who say, I wish, I, I wish I'd met you five years ago or 10 years ago or earlier in my career. So get the ideas out there. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any evidence around uh, whether it makes any difference whether you're negotiating with a male or a female? Good question. I get asked this a lot. And I, I often hear women say, well, the worst boss I ever had was a woman or I, you know, whatever, there was this woman and that, and that uh, you know, I hear that enough anecdotally that I'm sure that's a legitimate experience. I think that when women do not act in a caretaking, mentoring way, that violates our expectations for women. And so we may market more, we may notice and be more critical when a woman isn't as helpful or is you know a little harder to negotiate with but in fact the research shows that a man and a woman tend to reach better agreements negotiating than two men because men tend to go at it and that's actually not a good way to reach good agreements um two women negotiating together typically reach the best agreements because they tend to share more information listen better and try to do some you know, collaborative problem solving. Okay, so what are your big issues? This is what I need to do. Those are my goals. Let's see if we can work this out together. So that more adversarial approach that men take, actually not so good. And when women negotiate with men, they may be drawn towards that, you know, whatever, butting heads approach, which really disadvantages women a lot. So you typically will do better if you're negotiating with a woman. Okay, um, another question on a slightly different track is when you uh, published your book, first published book, Women Don't Ask, did you get any negative uh, feedback, people arguing against you, or was there broad agreement around it? Well, the great thing about Linda Babcock is she is a terrific researcher. And the research, you know, heavily vetted, it, it, it's really, it's really legitimate. And so that nobody could criticize that. I did, we did hear sort of, you know, vaguely, well, you know, if women, if women don't even have what it takes to negotiate for themselves, then maybe they don't have what it takes to, you know, be really successful at the top levels of this organization. And I think that is a, a, a mistaken impression that women convey when they do not advocate for themselves. That often in a job interview, the way you negotiate for yourself, people perceive as sort of a trial run or a demonstration of how good you will be at negotiating for the, for the organization, for the company, for the department, whatever. So failing to negotiate can actually 
suggest that you're less competent than you are, because as it turns out, women actually are great negotiating on behalf of other people, because caretaking, um, advocacy are gender norms for women, and we're really good at it. So by not negotiating well for yourself, you might be suggesting you wouldn't be good at negotiating for the company when in fact um, you would be. So that was the main thing. Well, if women can't do this basic workplace, you know, skill, if they're not good at that, then maybe they don't deserve to, you know, rise okay. higher. That's great. Listen, I'm really aware of time. I'm going to squeeze in at least one more if that's all right. Okay. Um, what impact do you think uh, maternity and maternity leave has on a woman's step, sort of ability to negotiate and the, the, the classic sort of gender pay kind of catch up years? Uh, it depends a lot on where you live um, in whatever, in the EU, in the UK to uh, a, a larger degree than here. It's kind of expected that women will take time off when they have babies. We don't have any mandated. Um, maternity leave in this country, which is shocking. Um, but it, you know, if you take any significant amount of time off besides whatever the basic leave is, that makes it really hard to get back into the workforce at the level you left. And for that reason, I strongly recommend keeping your hand in, you know, trying to work part time or at the very least staying in contact with your employer because they have invested a lot in you. They have trained you. They have you know, brought you up to speed at, you know, their culture, you know, all, you know, their intellectual property, their history, their clients, whatever. And losing you is actually expensive. Attrition is expensive, very expensive. So if you can stay in contact with them and let them know you're coming back and that you wanna, you know, keep your skills up and stay um, up to date on whatever go is going on in the field that will make it easier for you to negotiate whatever you want um, when you're ready to go full time again. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more. I'm, sure. squeezing, I'm squeezing this one in. Um, so you've answered, you've given some great answers and absolutely fascinating, but what happens if the answer's no? What happens if you ask and the answer's no? How do, and I'm adding to this with my own spin on this as well, if that's okay, I'll take liberty to do that. Is, is how do we hold employers and individuals within an organization to account when the answer's no? Well, if the answer is really no, uh, if you have, you know, whatever, pulled out all the stops, done all your research, made a great argument, and it's an arbitrary no that doesn't make any sense, that sometimes you need to get another job or at least get another offer and go back and say, not, you know, meet, meet this offer or I'm going to leave because then they're very likely to say, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out, but say, I've got this other offer it's a good offer and I would like to stay, but maybe we could talk about making that possible. Um, you know, or you can just say, well, I'm very disappointed. I'd appreciate it if you could think about it. And sometimes they will go back and, you know, not in the heat of the moment, they reflect on it and they think, yeah, actually I could do a little better. But, you know, if you're talking about a genuine roadblock, then sometimes you need to get another job. Okay, on that on that note, um, listen, I'm going to have to close the session tonight. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, for the audience's purpose, the recording will be available at, on the York Ideas YouTube channel. It can be accessed by typing York Ideas YouTube into Google and it'll come up, uh, but please allow a couple of days for it to appear. If you would like to purchase a copy of uh, the book, I'm just going to hold that so you know what it looks like and you see that's my personal copy with my notes in. Um, it will be available from our partner booksellers Fox Lane Books uh, and more information please look on our website or head to the foxlanebooks.co.uk. We very much hope that you will continue to be engaged in our York Ideas sessions through the open lectures. Uh, check out the website york.ac.uk events for full details. We'd love to hear your thoughts and uh, continue these conversations. Can I just thank you again, Sarah, for your time this evening uh, and thank you very much to our audience as well for participating uh, so in such an engaged way tonight and thank you very much.